a morning or good noon or what? It's 11.55, so I think good morning is appropriate. Good morning, and then later, five minutes later, it would be good afternoon, KubeCon. It's so great to be here um, in, in person in Valencia, Spain. So I'm so happy to see you guys in person again, and I'm here to talk about Minikube. So first of all, uh, Sharif could not make it, so I'm here uh, presenting for both of us. Uh, who am I? I am a technical lead manager at Google. I've been a Minikube maintainer since 2019, and I've worked other works in the open source world, Kitecar, Dunaker, Setup Minikube, GoPoke, a bunch of others. I have been doing a lot of open source works in my past four years of life. Uh, Sharif is also a software engineer. Uh, he's been part of the Google's Container Tools team since 2016, and Minikube's maintainer since 2019. Uh, Minikube started in 2016. Actually, it was started by Google by the same team that creates container tools. For example, uh, Scaffold, Canico, Jib, Kept, Tecton. So the same team that created those tools uh, created Minikube six years ago. And the original proposal was uh, just to a tool that gets you started with Kubernetes without pain, just like for learning Kubernetes, for somebody just like, I want to get my hands on Kubernetes. Uh, some, sometimes it's hard to remember that this, has, this project has been alive and it's been uh, working for you guys for past six years. Some people uh, remind us on Twitter, took a screenshot. Uh, but why Google is supporting Minikube? Google has been the main sponsor of Minikube uh, in terms of headcounts, getting full-time software engineering, uh, engineers working on them. Google contributes to a lot of open source projects. And I mean, Kelsey, I love Kelsey, so give it up for Kelsey. I think he is such an inspiring person. Uh, he is such a great person. I, I love Kelsey. But he missed to mention Minikube. So Kelsey, you're not perfect. <laughs> so uh, Google has been contributing to Minikube as the main sponsor, but we have maintainers across the world. One of the time, there was a time we dream, we dreamt that we have maintainers from four continents in the planet. but we only have three continents. Unfortunately, uh, we don't have Africa, but we like to have um, maintainers from all over the world. But why Google? Google uh, cares about uh, development experience uh, across, across the ecosystem, especially for Kubernetes. That's why the main reason Google has continued supporting this. And we are, I'm grateful for, for Google paying me to work on this. Uh, the primary goals of Minikube has been laid out, uh, and then we're very clear on a website. We are inclusive, community-driven, user-friendly, support for all Kubernetes features, class platform, reliable, high performance, and developer focus. These are our like goals and principles. Here is a fun chart I generated. This is the Minikube uh, code, uh, lines of code. Since we started in 2016, we are about 1.5 million lines of code. Looks a little bit scary, but you know, don't be scared. You can't contribute. Uh, who are behind Minikube's emojis? You know, uh, by a show of hands, who has used Minikube here? Oh my God. <laughs> Everybody almost. Uh, you guys know Minikube with the emojis, right? I, I talk to you guys like, oh, I like the emojis. Like, who are the people behind the emojis? Um, 729 uh, contributors have contributed to Minikube. But we actually built a tool in, in Minikube. We call it Pool Sheet. And we open source that tool as well. That tool visualizes the contributions that all our contributors do, including the contributors who do triage contributing. Like if you label issues for us, if you organize our issues, if you help other uh, users, we recognize that. Actually, go to our Minikube website you will see the yearly dashboard, all of the contributors to Minikube, exactly what they did. We have some fun categories, like the most helpful PR reviewer, the most uh, worthy PR reviewer. So like we have fun categories, check it out. Uh, the tool that we open source is called Pool Sheet. I'll set, uh, have a slide about the links of all of those in the a, in a, in a future. One thing I want to talk about Minikube that I like you guys know is Testing Minikube is different, very different. And I, I, I think no other project in our 
namespace has done testing like Minikube. And what is that? Minikube, as you guys might be aware, uh, uses many virtualization technologies to start a Kubernetes for you. It could be a VM driver or a container driver or no driver at all. But testing that, you cannot test that on a, on a container. You cannot test it on a normal Linux. You need a hardware that supports nested virtualization. And this was actually our first um, integration test machine that we built in San Francisco office in Google. We basically bought a bunch of Windows, Mac, and, and, and uh, Linuxes with GPUs and hooked it together, made a Jenkins out of it. Unfortunately, this uh, test lab died because of Corona, because we could not go to the office to you know, unplug it or restart it. So, uh, but this was our first um, uh, integration test. So because Minikube testing is hard and different, because we need nested virtualization. And you cannot have that on Mac OS or Windows in the cloud. Uh, Minikube has a huge amount of um, uh, support for different types of virtualization technology. So we have, of course, all the operating systems, two main CPU architectures, x86 and ARM. By the way, while I'm here, please use x86 if, instead of AMD64, please. Uh, it, I hit with my eyes when I have to figure out, is it ARM64 or AMD64? It's so hard. Just say x86, please. Let's all agree on this. x86, yes. <laughs> Thank you for that. Mini clap. <laughs> mini clap in a mini cube talk. Thank you. <laughs> um, so um, Minikube has support for many uh, architectures and many uh, runtimes. What is a runtime? But does anybody um, feel like they don't know what is a container runtime in a Kubernetes? Raise your hand if you don't know what is a container runtime. OK, seems like everybody knows. So uh, Minikube has support for three different runtimes for your engine, not for a driver. And also, you have different for for the CNIs. So we, we test all of that. All the green ones, we actually test them. The gray ones, we don't have integration tests for that. And we have a beast of engineering uh, out of uh, this. You have done so much automation to do the testing. The testing Minikube is very, very comprehensive. We have 46 <laughs> VMs to test Minikube in different clouds. Each cloud that would give us a different types of testing, GCP, AWS, Equinix, Metal, Azure, Maxidium, uh, Pro, and GitHub Actions. And we also have 296 integration test cases. Of course, you need know, test too. And we also have a detailed list of integration tests. And why we emphasize on integration tests so much? Because we, we are a small team that maintains a large project, and it's very hard to not break things. We break things all the time. And, you know, I break things all the time. And I want to save myself from myself by adding tons of integration tests. Like a user wants to start Minikube, deploys an app, and then they want to enable a CNI, and then they want to stop Minikube, and then when they want to start it again, and they want to expect all of that to be there. So let's add an integration test for that, and also for 296 other scenarios. We have a list of all of that in our website, all of the scenarios that Minikube tests. That makes my life easier. So if I accept a PR, I know it's going to not break things. But, 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 this is something I want to talk about. When you have so many integration tests in so many VMs in so many clouds, you review a PR, you see five failures out of 300. We are all now, if you're software engineers, we all have flake, flake tests. Who here has flake rates in their company? Like a test that flakes sometimes, but it's not a real failure. Okay, that's okay, okay, okay. I was a little bit terrified that nobody's gonna raise their hands like, oh, flake rate is your problem. We all have no. <laughs> okay, um, I think I've raised, I saw about 12 hands for the people who did not see the hands. Um, so um, we have tests that, you know, 10% of the time they fail, but they are innocent failures that they, they really not a test failure. But when you have five, six of them on a PR, you don't know which one is actual failure and which one is a. Uh, real failure of that PR. And we have been burned by that in the past. So we built a system called Flake Rate System to tell you this, uh, it comments on the PR, it tells you with a visualization, with a graphic, this test that failed on this PR has never failed on master before. And most probably is because of this PR. And we built this Flake Rate System for Minikube uh, based on GoPoke. And I'm gonna talk about GoPoke because 
this is, I was uh, adding this uh, picture right like 20 seconds ago and I was <laughs> Googling this. So you can see that I actually uh, didn't do a good job cropping the, the Google search. Anyway, uh, but what is GoPoke? Uh, so we have a lot of integration tests. Uh, and if you have seen Golang's integration test results, they are, uh, they're raw and Minikube's test logs are very verbose. And it's good that it's verbose because if it's something is failed, we, we know exactly what is going on. So a failed Minikube test log could be about 10 to 20,000 lines of logs. And that is really hard to look at if you're looking for a specific test. So I uh, built a tool called GoPog that converts the, uh, the Golang integration test results from raw to to HTML, I'm gonna show you guys an example of it. So this is to be like an example of test result. It's very hard, it's like let's say 290 tests. It's very hard to look what is what, right? So if you convert that to HTML, it will be like this. It will give you a summary, you can fold them and fold them. These are the failures and this is the duration. You can sort them and you can jump to every single one and open each one in a different window. So this helps us to squint less when we review PRs for our Minikube. Um, so, and by the way, we built the flake rate system on the top of GoPog. So if you are a Golang guys or girls or gals, and you could use GoPog to, you know, have a more human um, looking, human like, ah, that's a terrible, um, what would I say? More user friendly, uh, more user friendly uh, way of looking at test logs. This is a diagram of our infrastructure uh, uh, situation, we hooked up so many clouds to one master Jenkins, uh, I should have said one main Jenkins, sorry, uh, one main Jenkins uh, infrastructure. Minikube speaks your language. Uh, so we, uh, we have very enthusiastic translators uh, that have added translations to Minikube. So you can start Minikube with your language. Uh, we added the framework in 2019. Actually, you can check out that framework in Minikube repo as well if you want to add translation to your own Golang app. So uh, currently we have English, German, Spanish, uh, Chinese, French, Japanese, and Korean and Polish. So, and it's very easy to add your own language. If we are in Europe, if you're, if you're enthusiastic about that language and you want to add it to Minikube, just go to Minikube website, search for translation. There's a JSON file basically that you just fill it out and the JSON file, you don't have to be a software engineer to be honest to, to do any of that. Just like a, as long as you have the language skills, you could, you could contribute that to Minikube for more languages. Here's a slide that I promised you guys that I will show. These are the side projects of Minikube. If you wanna uh, take a look at it or screenshot it something, this is uh, all of them. So I'll go over them very quick, very quickly. Uh, Slowjam is a tool that we built to visualize the stack traces of uh, a Golang app. So if you have a Golang app and you want to visualize what is doing what and what is taking how much and visualize that, use Slowjam. Uh, Triage Party is a, another tool that graduated out of Minikube. We, I call them Minikube side project. We first built them for Minikube and then we just gave it out to the world and say, you can, everybody could use that. So Triage Party helps you to triage issues uh, in a crowdsourced manner. Minikube has 12,000 issues on GitHub. Can you believe that? Uh, and, and you know, that's so many of us who maintain Minikube. It's, it would be very hard if you wanted to trash all of it all ourselves. So we, we built this tool that you could crowdsource the trashing issues. And then we actually, we have this uh, weekly meeting called Trash Party, Wednesdays, uh, 11 a.m. Pacific California time. You could, welcome to join our party on Wednesdays. And Goldberg, I already talked about that. Time to Kate's. This is another tool that I really like. We built it for Minikube, but it's available for everybody. Uh, when we were trying to make Minikube fast, and Minikube used to be very slow, by the way. You probably guys already know. If, if you are a long time Minikube user, like three, four years ago, Minikube used to take three, four minutes to start. Um, so we, we invested a lot. Minikube is not slow anymore. Uh, but we built a tool called Time to Kates that measures exactly uh, how fast a Kubernetes cluster is ready to be used. They will tell you uh, in a visualized format that uh, this Kubernetes cluster is ready in 30 seconds or 60 seconds 
and the DNS answering is ready in 75 seconds, API server and etcd is So it will tell you in measurements of that matters for Kate. So that way you could compare Minikube against other similar tools. If you want to compare Minikube against, let's say, K3D, Rancher, a micro case or whatever, uh, it's a great tool. Minikube CI examples, a lot of people ask me, can I use Minikube in Prow and in, in GitHub Action, in uh, uh, whatever, Cloud Build, you can see detailed examples of that. And pool sheet is the one that we use to generate graphs for the contributors. It's like who contributed what and what amount, even the triage contributions. This is a slide I want to talk about, Kubernetes 124. Kubernetes 124 is a big one. It's a really big one for Minikube. Because Kubernetes, as you guys all know, I hope all, you all know, maybe you don't know, uh, they, they removed the support for Docker shim. It means Kubernetes no longer is maintaining that code. And this code has been donated to Mirantis, uh, and the Mirantis can continue that code for us. But that means Kubernetes, by default, will not work with Docker runtime anymore. If I go back to the earlier uh, slide here, we had three runtimes, uh, Docker, ContainerD, and Cryo. That means Docker would not work anymore. But that is a really bad thing, really, really bad thing. Why? Why is it a bad thing? Um, it's a bad thing because the Docker runtime for local developers matters a lot. Because when you build a Docker image, what do you build it with? Docker build, right? And uh, if you want to move that image to your cluster in Minikube, how, that will take a long time to just copy that image. If you, if you build it with Docker and you want to import it into container D, it will take uh, some time. And we actually generated a chart for that. It's 36 times slower if you do it uh, for container D. So Minikube decided that we really care, our main goals was for the developers. We, we like the developers to be happy. So we continue to support the Docker on time um, for Kubernetes 124, even though the Mirant, uh, we are doing it through the Mirantis uh, third party uh, uh, open source tool. Uh, another story with uh, Kubernetes 124 that we are struggling with is the C group V2. C group V2 is causing some headaches. Anybody else being caused that headache? Okay, one, one person. <laughs> uh, talk, come talk to me after this, okay? <laughs> uh, so we are working on it. Uh, the beta release of Minikube supports Kubernetes 124. With a gotcha, with a gotcha. Um, but we're working on it. Um, so we, we decided to continu uh, continue not leaving our uh, users who really care about building images fast you guys know Minikube, Docker, and command. That's, a, that's one of the most popular ways to build images, and it's very fast. Minikube has eight ways of building images if you are a developer. Minikube, Docker, and is the fastest one, and we will continue doing that for you guys. And, and it will be 36 times faster. Uh, and I want to talk about global warming, a completely different topic. <laughs> um, what do I want to talk about uh, global warming? And Minikube used to burn people's legs. Like, it was actually, we used to joke about that. Like, this is the Minikube's. Uh, uh, meeting, uh, meetings, 2016. It used to like really be bad. Like, you, like turn on Minikube, your laptop would be just mm -hmm, it's like start. You know, the fan noise would be up. There'd be so many issues. Like people will complain about that. We we fixed all of that. Uh, but I want to talk about um, how we did that. We 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 generated the flame graphs for every every function in the stack trace. We exactly figured out which one is taking much CPU. Anyway. I don't want to talk about that topic. There's another uh, talk uh, uh, in the two QCons before. I'll link to that. We, we fixed the uh, issues with the CPU, 50% less CPU usage, saving energy. But we have two new things that not many people use that. And you could use that if you want to save energy. So there's a, a command called Minikube pause that pauses the API server or Kubernetes, but it does not pause your applications. What does that mean? Let's say you apply an app to your Kubernetes cluster. You say kubectl apply my app. And that will deploy an app to your Kubernetes cluster. But now, if you say minikube pause, what will happen? It will pause the API server, 
Kubernetes API server. It basically pauses Kubernetes, but your app is still running inside Kubernetes. So that means you can pause Minikube whenever you want. Uh, uh, you can unpause Minikube whenever you want to apply a new YAML and pause it right after, because you don't need Kubernetes after that. Uh, so we also developed an add-on for Minikube called Auto Pause that will automatically pause Minikube for you when you are not using it for five minutes. So you could actually enable that add-on called Minikube Add-ons Enable Auto Pause. So if you want to be a good citizen and save energy for our planets, use that. I, I, I care about this because I hear in the KubeCon there was a talk that it's projected 8% of the global's electricity is going to be used on data centers and software. So I mean, we, we could do something a little bit, not much, in the software world to save energy. Minikube loves benchmarking. Uh, you guys already saw some benchmarkings on, the, on my slides, but we have dedicated a section of our website called Minikube Benchmarking. If you guys go to the Minikube uh, website now and uh, go under the benchmarking section, there's a section called for CPU usage. There's a section for image builds. Uh, so, and there's a section for time to case. And then we, we do them weekly daily and per release. We also benchmark Minikube against uh, similar tools like Kind, K3D, Microcades. We want to know how Minikube is doing against uh, the similar tools all the time. So if, you're, if you like benchmarking like me, uh, if you want to see more of that, go to the Minikube website, benchmarking section. We've got tons of things for you to look at. Now let's talk about a whole new Topic, Minikube face image. Um, who here uses Minikube's VM driver as opposed to the Docker driver? Not that many. So who uses a Docker driver? Okay, more people use Docker driver. Okay. So we have two base image in Minikube. One of them is for the Docker. It's a Docker file, basically, based on Ubuntu. And one of them is an ISO that we built uh, for the VM drivers. And this ISO is six years old. And we basically built our own Linux. We are maintaining a Linux distro for Minikube. It's just enough Linux for Kubernetes. We are planning to uh, graduate this uh, project out of Minikube, just like many other projects that were graduated out of Minikube. Uh, so it will be an ISO for the whole world that is just enough kernel modules for Kubernetes. We handcrafted this ISO. It's very small compared to the com uh, similar ISOs that I've seen. There's like some of the ISOs like 800 megabytes, some of them a couple of gigabytes. Um, and we first started uh, based on a core OS build route, but we diverged so much that we can no longer, we can no longer see anything similarity between core OS and the Minikube's ISO. Uh, and there's also some advantage of this is in our benchmarking showed that Minikube's VM driver is actually uses the least amount of CPU. That was surprising for myself to see compared to Docker driver. So Minikube's VM driver uses less CPU. And it's because we handcrafted this ISO. Um, uh, I want to pivot to a chart that we have. This is our, based on our surveys. We, we collect surveys. And we have three types of Minikube users. And they mostly use Minikube for learning Kubernetes or develop on Kubernetes um, or use it in test and CI. But what I want to talk about is there's a new category of you guys out there, and you guys are sending surveys, you're sending blog posts, Twitters. We hear you. We hear you. Uh, I think it was last year that Docker Desktop announced that they going to charge companies for more than, more than 200 employees and $10 million revenue, I believe, if they use Docker Desktop. So it's, uh, Docker Desktop is a commercial product, paid commercial product. And initially, a few users posted a blog post that I am using Minikube as a Docker Desktop replacement. Uh, it's like, oh my god, this is a new type of users. Um, and it turns out, uh, the, the demand is really high. Like we, we, I took a quick uh, analysis on the survey. There's a huge amount of interest for this. And um, you could see some of the screenshots on that. So a lot of people are very happy with replacing Docker desktop with Minikube. For that reason, 
the additive feature is very, very ironic, very ironic, that you can start Minikube without Kubernetes. <laughs> I never thought I would see this. I, I've been maintaining Minikube a long time, and uh, I developed a feature that starts Minikube without Kubernetes. It's just a Minikube VM with a container runtime inside of it. Uh, it could be Docker, it could be ContainerD, it could be Cryo. So people who use Minikube as a Docker desktop uh, replacement, they use this uh, flag. I just wanted to show it to you guys. Um, who else here uses one of the similar tools to Minikube, like Kind, K3D, or MicroKates? Okay, a few hands. Um, there are many, many nitty-gritty small uh, differences between all of them, but if you ask me what are the main differences between them, I would say the main difference is Minikube supports multiple container runtimes. All other tools that I mentioned, they are container D runtime. Minikube has Docker, container D, and Cryo. Minikube is more diverse in that sense, and the Docker part of it is very important for, uh, for fast image build. By the way, uh, let me pivot back to the previous one, that people using Minikube as a Docker desktop replacement. That means, as you guys know, Docker is two parts. One of them is open source Mavi project, which is an open source engine, and one of them is Docker desktop. Docker desktop is a commercial product, but the Docker container runtime itself is a free product. So when you use Minikube as a Docker desktop replacement, you could basically install a Docker CLI and still Docker image build in an open source free way and build it against Minikube's Docker. That's how people are using it. So it could get confusing. So the main difference of Minikube, I would say, is the container runtimes. We support all of them. Uh, and also, the second difference is a fast image build, 36 times faster image build, according to our benchmarks, than other tools. So if you're an app developer who wants to develop apps on Kubernetes on your laptop, I think the Minikube is the only answer for you. And also our integration test is comprehensive. I, in our namespace, I don't know any other project who is doing this level of uh, massive amount of integration tests uh, on physical machines. Um, advantages of VM drivers. There was a time, uh, I think 20, uh, early 2020, or maybe late 2019, uh, a lot of people asked me, is there even a need for Minikube to continue the VM drivers? I'm a kind of a stubborn guy, and I said, yeah, I want to continue supporting VM drivers. Uh, I never thought one day I will see this level of interest in VM drivers again, but I just, I myself love the VM drivers more than the Docker driver. I don't know why. Um, uh, I just loved it. So I, I continued, with my stubbornness, I continued doing it. Uh, but now there's a huge amount of interest in it and a lot of people using VM drivers again uh, because Docker desktop is a VM driver too. So you, they, you're not gonna have a container on Mac or Windows ever. You need a Linux. You need somebody to visualize that for you. Uh, and I like the Minikube's ISO. It's very small. That's one of the reasons for my stubbornness on it. Um, it VM drivers clearly, clearly use significantly less CPU than the Docker driver. And one of my favorite things with the VM driver is you can hit the IP directly. So if you have a service on a host port on Kubernetes deployed, let's say it's on port 80, you can hit the Minikube's IP on port 80 directly. On container drivers like Docker or Podman, you would have to translate that port to a random port, and it kind of looks ugly to be honest. Uh, it's like Minikube IP, instead of port 80, would be 32, some random port, you know. Um, so it's like it's an extra ugliness that I don't like personally. Two pieces of exciting news. Okay. I, I saw a lot of Twitter, and we also have survey responses. We have about, I think, 32 survey responses that they explicitly said, we, uh, in, we asked the question, what Minikube could do better, uh, if you could tell us. And they, they told us, we want VM drivers on M1. M1, as you guys probably know, is Apple's new hardware. It's ARM64 based. And people want a driver that would work on it with a VM driver. You could use the Docker driver, but. 
So I have exciting news for you. We have KeyMU driver working, and I tried it yesterday myself. And a uh, huge amount of work went to this. It took us a long time, and you guys were patient with us. Thank you for being your patience. Uh, it was hard to deliver this. Uh, we have a new brand new driver called KeyMU driver. So this means even on ARM64, an, an Apple M1, you could start MiniQ with KeyMU driver. I have a um, uh, personal likeness for KeyMU. I think it's a great open source project. And my dream is to make KeyMU the, the unified driver everywhere on any platform. So you could have KeyMU on Windows, Linux, Mac, and they will be all same VM driver. But I need some help, guys. Uh, I, if you guys are experts um, on, on virtualization and ISO, come talk to me. And I actually might be hiring as well. Um, um, so you could actually try the KMU driver today. Uh, just basically brew install KMU on your Mac, and then in a, install the beta version of Minikube, not the stable one. And then Minikube start dash dash driver KMU2. And if you want to download the beta, of Minikube, easy. Go to Minikube website, and then click on your, your uh, platform, for example, Mac OS ARM64 beta. Make sure you choose the beta. That way, you could try the uh, KMU driver. It was very hard, to be honest, to deliver this. We have been working on it a uh, few months. Uh, so we basically had to rebuild our just enough Linux for Kubernetes for ARM64. Every package had to be done again. Every kernel module had to be done. And then we had issues with AppArmor. AppArmor does not like the, the EFI bias, because if you want to have an ARM64 ARM machine, you cannot have a BIOS anymore. You, you, can, you need to have an EFI bootloader. So we put a tremendous amount of energy to make the EFI work, but then AppArmor was not happy. It was like, I don't like EFI. And it was a lot of work. Uh, kudos to Sharif Al Gamal. Uh, he, he's not here today. I mean, he's in California. I couldn't make it. Uh, he uh, and really he did amazing work on this. And also um, uh, Anders Bjorklund uh, or other uh, maintainer. He guided us through this. And I'm very grateful for having such amazing team and amazing uh, uh, maintainers in Minikube. So try try the the KMU driver. Another exciting news. Um, uh, we have a GUI for Minikube, finally. This was something people have been asking us, and I was like always like on the, what's the word, fence? Um, to say, like, GUI, come on, guys. Minikube does not need a GUI. But now we have a GUI, and you convinced us, OK? <laughs> uh, it's built in Q3. I can show you like a little bit of it. Uh, I don't know if I am. Um, actually, this is, so this is a Minikube GUI, the betray icon. Uh, like this, um, you can see starting a Kubernetes. You can see there's a KMU running, and you can create another one um, like that. So this is a early, um, early development. If you want to give it a try, uh, go to Minikube website and search for Minikube GUI. We have instructions how to um, install it. Cool. Uh, new contributors are always welcome. You know, check out our office hours, Mondays, California time, uh, 11 a.m. Uh, look out for good first issues. We are very friendly, but we also want experts, and I am hiring. So DM me on Twitter. If you, if you want to work with low-level Linux stuff, um, or if you have GUI skills like Qt, C++, or hypervisor technologies, and build roots. Build root is... Uh, the tool that we use to build our own Linux. And that was the end of my slides, and I just remembered I forgot to put the Minikube's Twitter in my slides. So Minikube's Twitter is just minikube underscore dev. Uh, follow us. Uh, we, whenever we release, we, we share our um, a release on, on Twitter. Uh, and I'm available for any questions you might, guys might have. So thank you very much.
If you have any questions, let me know, and I'll get the mic to you. Hi, thank you a lot for your talk. I'm more interested into the VM driver, and I would like to know several things about it. First of all, you just say that you will move it to a dedicated repo. And so what are your plans regarding the kernel version? Because actually, if I remember correctly, the kernel version of the image is for the Nightning. And I would like to know if you plan to bump it. Uh, so your question about, uh, I didn't understand your question. Your question was about the versioning of the ISO? No, I didn't understand it. No, it is the version of the kernel inside the VM driver. Yeah. So currently we have kernel 4.9, which is a shame, uh, I know. We have been wanting to go on uh, kernel point, uh, 5.10. However, we waited till we figured out the bootloader situation. The bootloader was very difficult to make it work, and we didn't want to introduce two big new changes at the same time. So it's like, now that we have the bootloader under control, for sure we're going to uh, invest in kernel 5.10. I think that's, that's the right thing to do, especially with the C group V2 uh, being uh, uh, supported mostly on kernel 5. Yeah. Okay, and then regarding build root, I see in your repository that you have, the, that you have a dedicated uh, directory for .mk files, the, basically the build root recipe. And so do you have some plan to upstream them because it will be far easier for your life? I like your question. I think you, your question shows you actually have been uh, looked at that. So uh, that's, a, uh, that's a question. So, uh, we do not uh, plan to have the, the file system overlay, as, as what you're referring to, into the open source part. That would be something that the way we're going to build it is like anybody who wants to use this ISO, they will, they will get the ISO and add their own files on top of it. So Minikube will be one of the users of that model. That we will make a model that the overlay will be p built as a part of the Minikube build, but on the same ISO uh, generic one. Okay, and then another one remark maybe because, I, but I'm not sure about it. You say that you're using uh, UEFI BIOS. Uh, what about using particularly for the ARM port, the U-boot to basically boot the Linux? Because U-boot on Linux on ARM64, it is just perfect. And for uh, UEFI BIOS, I'm not so sure. So do you have some plan to maybe use U-boot? And I'm almost sure but within build root, you can just tick one, uh, make menu config, and you have a U boot. Um, I don't think we're going to have that option. That would be slightly above the scope of us to, to have that option uh, configured. If we can, make, if like, we have a contributor that who wants to take the ownership of that, we will. But one of the things that I focus on as a maintainer of Make is keeping it maintainable for myself and my team, because we're a small team. And that seems like something would be. Uh, challenging to give that option. If we promise that option, I would want to see the implementer of that option. It would give me a assurance that it's going to be easy to maintain. Uh, but I do think um, EFI is the future of the bootloaders, uh, I mean, for, for Minikube. So we have delivered that for ARM64, but for AMD uh, or x86, we continue the BIOS uh, on bootloaders. Yeah. Okay. Good question. Thank you a lot. No problem. Thanks, everyone, for coming. We're a couple minutes over, so we'll stop it there. But if you have additional questions, I'm sure Medea yeah. will stick around a little yeah. bit. Sounds <laughs> good. Thank you very much, everybody.